Okay. Uh, first announcement I'd like to make is um, if you haven't been, it's uh, you should have been, and if not, it's probably time to uh, make sure uh, that your grades are what you expect. Mainly, make sure I didn't enter them incorrectly or something's missing. Post it on WebAssign because it shows what your homework grades are and your exam grades, including this correction. So, uh, at some point, uh, it'd be good if you went on there and verified that, oh, wait, there's a zero here? I swore I turned one in because... I'm, in, I'm, I'm fallible. <laughs> I've caught a few of those and been trying to fix them. So if you guys all check your own, then we'll be good. And let me know. You can email me or whatever. So, and it would be better to take care of that now than, you know, after the final. And you all onslaught me because I uploaded the wrong column. I don't know. <laughs> Second, uh, where's, he, where's he at? The electrostatic, anti-electrostatic tape. Uh, there he is. Sorry. Uh, somebody gave me this and he was curious. This is what I've learned. Remember how I, I pulled tape off of a roll and it got charged up because uh, as it came off the roll, two materials separated and charges separated. And so they, they would repel from each other and whatnot. This is, claims to be anti-static tape. Well, how's that work? It's separating. Well, what I figured out, I'm not a genius, but uh, what I have learned is this is made out of pure cellulose. And the glue they use in the, is cellulose-based as well. And so it's, it's less like two materials being ripped apart. You rip the same materials apart, you get less charge. I won't lie, there is a very little charge on here, but it decays really fast. It conducts away to like the moisture in the air. So if I rip two of these off and hold them, yeah, I can't tell that they're charged at all. So sometimes you need applications where it's, uh, you don't want any static charge. They do sell as well ones with a conductive grid inside. And if it's a conductor, then charge won't accumulate. It can spread out or, or uh, flow off away. But if it's an insulator, it wants to stay put. So they made it out of cellulose, and that tends to reduce it significantly. See it? All right. Thanks for sharing that. I learned myself. Okay, we ended with uh, right on series and parallel circuits last time. So I'm going to get into that. Before I do, I put this on the ground to hide it from you and forgot to show you. So I'm showing you now. Here is, remember it's about the same brightness as a 100 watt bulb, but it's a compact fluorescent. And this one only used about 13 watts when we plugged it in at the end of class last time. And so it really does save a lot of energy. So I was curious, all right, 100 watt bulb incandescent. What would it look like if that was 100 watts? What would you expect? A lot brighter, yeah. So I was like, too bad they don't make them because they always make, you know, 100 watt equivalent, 60 watt equivalent, which means these are a lot lower wattage. Well, found one. <laughs> this is listed as 105 watts, as close as I could get to 100 watts. It just looks great. <laughs> yeah, that's brighter. Well, it should be, 100 watts, that's power. So it's using as much energy as this is. But since it's more efficient, yeah, we're, it, it come, it's converting it to light a lot better. More of the uh, electrical energy is going to light instead of heat. Wasted is heat going through this. Although the fact that this heats up is why it glows. That's how this one works. We don't need to do that with these. Oh, that's bright. <laughs> so, yeah, if these weren't so expensive, even, even still, I was thinking of putting a few of these in my home, maybe on the porch, you know, when it's, they flip the light. <laughs> okay. I guess you could get those floodlights too, but that was just fun. So I had to show you, they actually do make big ones. So you can, you can spend just as much money as you're used to and just have your house brighter than you need. All right. Well, let's see, you know, these are a couple bucks and these on average are what, 10, 15, and this was, oh, I can't remember. Do you remember, Catherine, because you were just looking at something the other day, but it was under 50. 
So it's not ridiculous, but you know, you go to buy a light bulb, you don't think you're spending 30, 40 bucks. So. I, I can't remember at this point. I just remember, whoa, that was more than I was anticipating. <laughs> so I only bought two. Okay. So I need my power source here. 12 volt battery. You think it's DC or AC? DC. DC, very good. This is our uh, little little board. And I've connected the positive to the red. You see the red tape? There's a conductor underneath, a wire that follows that line. And the negative side, the blue tape. And the switches. See the little knife thing is in the middle, lined up with the green tape. So if I want current to go through this bulb, I've got to connect it, get current to it. So I can connect this either way. It doesn't matter. I'm going to go to the positive. Well, it doesn't light up because I don't have a complete path yet. Current can, uh, the, you can pretend like it's going into here through the switch from the red to the green into the light bulb, through the light bulb, but it's open. The switch is open like this one. Those of you that can't see. And so we need to give it a path back. If I give it the same path back, like to the red side, that doesn't help. It needs to see, be able to see the other side of the battery. So if I flip it the other way, now we have a complete path. The electric field's established. There's a difference in voltage. The charges fill a force. They start drifting along. And we'd say this is in series. So the current comes in through the switch, through the bulb, through the switch to the other side, they can get back to this side of the battery. If I open this one back up and say, let's go through this bulb and this bulb and this bulb and this bulb, uh, we can get, well, let's just do two of them. Come to this side. And what do you notice different about the bulbs? They're dimmer. Uh, what do you think that tells you? I'm hearing, yeah, I'm, I like the one the best. They're, they have to share the voltage. They're in series like this, and you see that if the, the charge flows along, let's say like this, when it goes through the light bulb, it, it must expend some of that electrical energy and convert it to heat. So there's a, it has less energy after it goes through the light bulb. There's been a voltage drop, energy per charge. And since the battery sees two of them in the circuit, they must share the voltage. So if this is 12 volts, this one's using 6 volts, and this one's using 6 volts. So in series, we share the voltage. It's a good thing to note if you haven't. It's in your book too. But And so if we hook up four of them, how many volts do you think each of them will use up? Three volts, and I expect them to look dimmer. Now these are all the same bulb, type of bulb, so they have the same resistance. And so they're all affected equally. What if this bulb uh, had a lot more resistance? What do you think would happen to it? It'd be dimmer. It'd be dimmer. And would it use up more voltage or less voltage? It's got more resistance. It's going to be harder to go through. It's still this whole conservation energy. If there's more resistance, you're going to have to do more work to get through it. So yeah, it, it'll use up more energy per charge. Energy per charge is voltage. So there will be a bigger voltage drop across this bulb. But they'll, st they'll still have to share it. These guys will get some, 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 some. This guy will just take more of it if, they, if he has more resistance. Does that make sense? So if he takes more, that means there's less the Yeah, yeah, because they all have to share whatever. The, this pro can provide 12. They split it up in series. If he took up four, that would leave how much left? Eight. Yeah, these three would have to split the eight. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people think, oh, let's say this one has a whole lot of resistance and uses up 12 volts. These guys would never light. No, in a series circuit, as soon as you close the switch, the electric field is established everywhere, and miraculously, it knows what to send out. It's kind of like, still like a miracle to me. It, it, it senses the total resistance in the circuit and divvies it up accordingly. 
It's not like, oh, we went through this one, used some up. We went through this one, used some up. Oh, too bad we don't have any left. You guys are out of luck. No. And if I unscrew this one? Yeah, I hate that. Christmas lights. <laughs> took me a couple hours, I'll admit, this last Christmas. I had one go out. I wasn't going to restring that Christmas tree. It took me forever. Anyway. But the current can't get through this to get back to the other side of the battery. So there's no electric field established. They, they don't get any power. No current flows. Yeah, and I realize you can't see the construction underneath, but this side of the battery is connected to the red tape. That, this side of the switches, if you will. And this side of the battery is the blue tape, this side of the switches. So with, all this, with the switches up, so you can see this one, then uh, anything that's trying to flow through the bulbs, it can't see either side of the battery. So it doesn't flow. This one I'm going to connect the middle, the bulbs, to one side of the battery. It can now get into this bulb and over to this one and this one and this one. But there's no path back yet because none of all these are still up and open. If I flip this one down, two can get back. If I flip this one down, three. Come on, baby. There you go. Can get back. And four. It's a series, a complete path. How does the current compare in each bulb? It's the same. A series circuit, it has to be. Whatever gets through this, gets to this, gets to this, is moving. They're all moving at the same time. It's the same current everywhere in a series circuit. What's the current in the battery? S current. Same as whatever it is in the bulbs. So in series, current is the same everywhere. The voltage is shared. And that's to go to parallel. Does the current... Oh, that's a good question. Okay, let's do this series circuit. Do you think... We're going to compare the amounts of current that's flowing right now, which is the same everywhere in this circuit right now. That current compared to this other circuit. Let's hook all four up in series. How do you think the current compares in this circuit compared to the first circuit? They're two different circuits. He is right. This circuit has different resistance than this circuit. The current is the same here, here, and here for this circuit. And the current is the same here, 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 and here in this circuit. But the current in this circuit is not the same as the current in this circuit. Because this one only has to go through two bulbs. Is that less resistance or more resistance? Less resistance in this circuit, so more or less current can flow. More. So this has more current flowing through it. It's the same current here, here, and here. But it's more than the current flowing in this circuit. Because as you add more and more light bulbs the battery sees that total resistance increase and thus can't push as much current through each of them. It's the same through each of them, but not the same as the two bulb circuit. Good, good. Most of America does not know that. <laughs> Feeling smart? Okay. Parallel is kind of the flip. To do that, we can have this one come back. And I'm having it come back on the blue side, my side over here. Since this one can go back to the blue, I'm going to flip this one back to the red. And so, I know you can't make it out, but it looks like this. You know, just two of them at the moment. Oh, heck. Do all four. And so, if current comes out of here, it gets to this point and it has a choice. It can go that way to get back to the battery, or it can go this way and get back to the battery or this way, or this way, it has a choice because it can see both sides of the batteries multiple paths. So in a parallel circuit, the current splits and is shared. Here the voltage is shared. Here the current is shared. So if this puts out 
let's make it easy, um, 8 amps. I don't know what it is, but let's say it, put out, it puts out 8 amps of current. How ma many do each get? In parallel. 8 amps come out of here. 2 will go that way. 2, 2, and 2. Though It has to share the current because the current can split. If some of it's going to go this way, then some of it goes this way. And you can't have all of it going everywhere if it's going to split up. So if 8 comes out, then you get 2, 2, 2, and 2. The current is shared. But the voltage is the same. Here we had to share the voltage. Here we don't. And that one, I like drawing it like this. This side of the battery... Where I shade it, it all has like the same potential. The same amount of energy per charge, same voltage. Those are all the same thing. Energy per charge, voltage, electric potential. Because, you know, ideally if, no, if it hasn't used up in the wires, which it usually doesn't, it's minimal, then we haven't done any work. We haven't expended any energy along the path I shaded. We haven't gone through anything to expend the work, the energy. And this side is the same. It's all at the same potential on that side. And so each bulb sees the same difference in potential, the same difference in voltage. They, they all see 12 volts, 12 volts, 12 volts, 12 volts, 12 volts. Does that make sense? Because, again, because the path can split. So here, current, same, voltage, shared. And the opposite over here, current, shared, voltage, same. So, these two are in parallel. Do, do you, yeah, I need to do that one too. We uh, discussed at the end last time, review, if you add more bulbs in parallel, what do you think that does to the current coming out of the battery? So this case, certain currents coming out of the battery, they split it up, and then we add two more. How do you think the current compares now coming out of the battery? I'm getting the same and the more. So it's one. Well, nobody went with less, it sounded like. It would be more. Because there's more pathways to go through. So if, if I need to get through, not only split it up to these guys, but I'm going to split it here too, I need more to begin with. This is a good way to think of it. Another way to think of it is if you have more pathways, it's like a thicker wire. Instead of having one little narrow spot to go through, let's make it broader, like a fatter wire. Oh, I can go this way or this way or this way or this way. And a fatter wire has less resistance because you're not trying to cram it all through. So uh, as you add, the battery sees a certain resistance. You add a couple more. The actual total resistance goes down that the battery sees. And if their total resistance goes down, then it can push more current out, which it does in parallel, as you add more and more in parallel. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Uh, the current here in series is something. And as I add more in series, the, the resistance increases, so the current is less. It's the same here, 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 and here, because they're in series, but it's less now than it is now, because the resistance of the circuit changed. In, in this case, here we've got to get through uh, two bulbs. Here we've got to get through four. There's twice as much stuff to get through, and so as you try to bombard the electron through, it meets more resistance and will use up more energy. 
it is exactly like making the wire longer. Here's like a short wire, and here's a real, you know, twice as long a wire. Good. And four in series, certain current going through them, they all get the same, compared to four in parallel. A lot more current is being drawn. The resistance the battery sees now is less than when they're in series, which is why more current is being drawn. Ohm's law. That tells you, you know, you change one, how the other is affected. And that applies to everything we just discussed. Now if I unscrew one, the others still have a path. They still both see both sides of the uh, battery, and so they can still have charges flowing and don't go out. Yes, each bulb individually still has the same resistance. It's just negligent. But as the total resistance changes. So here, the resistance across this guy is the same, because these are the same bulbs, as this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, no matter what the circuit. But if you hook them up in series, the total resistance increases, so less current flows. You hook them up in parallel, there's, there's multiple paths, the resist, so the resistance decreases total, and so this pushes out more current. So when you hook things up in parallel, this is nice. I know which one went out, but it's going to cost you more because you're drawing more current. Yeah, things in parallel are great. Our houses are hooked up in parallel. Good thing. So when one thing blows, you know, each of your outlet is like a separate parallel port. But yeah, it does cost more. Yeah. These are 12 volts, 50 watts. Let's figure out the current then, shall we? I said they are 12 volts, 50 watts. Do you remember that power is current times voltage? That's the other important one. So we, we don't know the current, so let's solve for the current. That's power over voltage. Just rearranging that equation. The power is 50, the voltage is 12, I don't know what that is, let's see, 48 goes in four times, so it's four something. <laughs> it's a little over four amps of current is what was flowing through uh, that bulb. <laughs> And that's what would be flowing through that bulb. So we got four amps here and four amps here. I know that this must be drawing eight amps because they're in parallel. There you go. Series and parallel circuits. Any other questions at this point? I'm sure as it sinks more in, you might have more of it. All right, get your clickers out then. I'll ask you a couple questions. Let's see how we're doing as a group. Polling's open, go ahead. <laughs> so some of you don't care, you're actually responding. All right, projector's on, it's on computer.
didn't automatically find it, so I'll go force it. Give me a second. Go, go now. Shwoo. Those 12 of you that already voted, feel free to read the question now and vote appropriately. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Meh. Half of you think it's B, quarter of you think D. So charge flows, some of you think it's all. Voltage flows in a circuit or a battery is a source of electrons? Correct answer is B. Voltage doesn't flow. That's the uh, energy per charge. What is it that actually flows in the circuit? Moves the charges. Voltage is just a state. That's the push. It's what pushes the charges around. And the uh, source of your electrons does not come from the power supply or the power company. You're paying for energy, not electrons. The electrons are already in your circuit, in the wire, in the bulbs, the filament. You know, the electrons that are already in your filament, as soon as you, you, it sees a voltage, an electric field, they start to move, charge flows. And they, they heat up as they go through that resistance and glow. Yes? And charge and force interchangeably? Charge and force interchangeably, no. The, the charges won't move unless they feel a force. What provides that force? An electric field. Remember that was separating charges. You know, if you get an accumulation of positive here and negative, then they now have a certain, it, that took work to do that, to separate charges. So there's energy stored in that system, energy per charge. There's an electric field between them. And any charges that get in between the path, the conductor, the wire, they're going to feel that force, that Coulombic force, because positives are attracted to negatives and repelled from positives. So the, the, the force is provided by that electric field to move the charges around, but it's the charges that flow. Okay, I wanted to do... this one. Your clue is Ohm's Law, the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. And if you don't memorize the uh, formula, I hope that me telling you, voltage is what pushes the charge. You increase the voltage, you push more charge. Resistance is what hinders the charge. So if you've got more resistance, that's going to decrease your current. So it's directly proportional to voltage. It's inversely proportional to resistance. And that's where they got Ohm's Law. Ten, oh, yeah. So I am using those interchangeably, yes. Uh, you think of voltage as the push, because they happen together. When you separate charges, you now have the positives and the negatives. There's an electric field set up, and any charges in, in the way will feel a force. At the same time, though, when you separate charges, 
you just stored energy per charge, which electric potential, which is the same thing as voltage. So by separating charges, you establish an electric field and have a difference in potential, thus a voltage. So you can think of them, those as interchangeable. Uh, we like using voltage when we're doing circuits because we see a battery, it's 12 volts. If one side's 12 volts and the other's zero, there's a difference. Only when there's a difference in voltage will there be an electric field causing them to move around. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 89 percent A. Very good, very good. Um, let me turn on the lights for those that didn't get that. I just forgot the numbers. 110 over 22. <laughs> voltage, it's going to increase. Resistance is on the bottom because you increase that, you'll decrease. So 110 volts over 22 ohms gives you 5 amps. All right, who in here has never played with a magnet? That's what I thought. The next chapter is magnetism. Magnets are cool. <laughs> And this chapter won't take as long because it's more familiar and we've already actually discussed a lot of it. There's a lot of analogies. So I expect to get, well, yeah, we'll finish next lecture before the end. So, Magna started with uh, people in Magnesia, which was owned by Greece at the time. And they saw these rocks called lodestones. And it had an interesting property that iron seemed to stick to it. This is the biggest piece of lodestone I've ever seen in my life. I love it. And we have it. Woo. I'm sure there's bigger, but I've only had little pieces when I was a kid. And you see the iron filing sticking to it? There, there, it this is magnetized. And that was a neat property of it. And I'm sure the name came from Magnesia. And so they call it, oh, it's a magnet. And we started uh, trying to figure out this property. Uh, there's magnetic forces, just like electric forces. Remember before we had, uh, oh, no, I don't want to say that yet. But uh, just like with charges, positives and negatives attract. Negative and negative repel. Positive and positive repel. You get the same thing within magnets. They're called poles. Instead of charges, we call them poles. And here's a typical bar magnet. You can have a north pole and a south pole. And you think of the poles as the charges. They have a force between them. The electric force, we learned, was due to the charge. Remember if you had a charge, it's got an electric field. Does it go away or towards a positive charge? Away, good. So just the fact that it's a charge, there's this electric field around it. And we just reiterated that electric fields can exert forces on other charges. The magnetic force is due to Q, and I'll just put V, velocity. A moving charge. If the charge is just sitting there, there's an electric field around it. If it's moving, wiggling, spinning, revolving, as long as there's some motion involved, then it also has a magnetic field. And it creates uh, poles and there's forces between poles. We won't use the formula much for, you know, qu quantitatively, but you remember the electric field? Coulomb's law was that. There's a similar one with magnetism. Well, I will just put proportional. Pole one, pole two, and their distance. 
It's the same inverse square law as the electric force and the gravitational force out in the universe between two masses. You change the distance, then the force is affected by it squared. And you increase the strength of either pole, you increase the force. Um, I like the analogy here with fluids. Remember with fluids, we, uh, fluid flows when there's a difference in pressure. Just like charges flow with a difference in voltage, potential. Otherwise, they don't move. Uh, we could also get a change in pressure by moving the fluid. Remember Bernoulli's principle? So you, you got the fluid and there's pressure associated with it. Remember you just raise up a column of water or dive down into the ocean and you're going to increase the pressure on you because there's more, f more stuff above you. That's kind of like this. The more charge you have, the greater the, the electric force. But if you start moving a fluid, that could create a change in pressure also. Bernoulli's principle. Well, now if we start moving charges, we're going to get an additional force, a magnetic force. And the source of all magnetism is uh, move, moving charges. That's a good one to write, too. It's a textbook says that well as well. Um, electrons in an atom have charge. So they have an electric field. They're moving, though. They spin about their axis and they revolve around the nucleus. Both of those are types of motion, both of which create a magnetic field around the charge. Excuse me, because it's moving. So an electron has an electric and a magnetic field. Yeah? Uh, just because something has more electrons, or even in the outer shell, doesn't determine, doesn't make it magnetic. So because the electrons are less likely to um, move from one shell to a different one, does that change the magnetism? The, the, the motion between, changing between shells and energy levels doesn't affect it either. So what does make something magnetic? If you got one electron spinning, say, this, I, I should have brought a ball out. Oh well. <laughs> Say it's spinning like this, then it'll have a, a certain magnetic field, and it, it, it'll, you can picture it as a little bar magnet, and say it's like this. If it's spinning the other direction, then the, the magnetic field it creates is opposite in the other direction. And if you have two of those next to each other, it's like this, and this guy's field kind of cancels this guy's field. And so macroscopically, on the bigger scale, you can't really tell. They each have their little magnetic field. So what makes something magnetic, like these, are that if there's a net alignment of these little microscopic magnetic dipoles, they're called magnetic fields. All the little uh, atoms in here, if they're, if they're lined up more one way than the other, like this, now there's an overall field in that direction. But if you flip one compared to the other, they kind of cancel each other out. So what makes a magnet magnetic is that net effect of alignment. They're not all aligned that way, but the majority is. And the more that are aligned in the same direction, the stronger the magnet. These neodymium magnets that are popular now, the rare earth element, neodymium, iron, and boron together, they have more aligned per mass. And so they have a stronger magnetic field than these, which are uh, alnico, aluminum, nickel, and cobalt combination. And those magnetic fields look like electric fields. Um, if you have a bar magnet, and here's the North Pole, and whoops, here's the South Pole. They go, by definition, from out north poles and into south poles and then go around. Get out of the way. So magnetic fields are the sim same games play like with electric fields and where the lines are closer together right here around the poles 
It's a stronger field, can tell you that. But they go from north to south. The thing with magnetic field lines, though, are they are closed loops. Inside the magnet, we have all these uh, little atoms and, that are aligned, the, a net alignment. And they're, fa they're pointing that direction. That's what makes it a magnet. So some people get confused because inside the, a magnet, the field lines go from south to north. Outside the magnet, they go north to south. But if you see, see it as a complete loop, then they have to at least match up and go the same way. Yeah. Exactly. If you cut a, a magnet in half, here's north, here's south. Oh, yeah. This doesn't, oh, now I just have a north. No. <laughs> this became a south pole now. And so it still has the same magnetic field as this guy did. And this has one, too. This became a north, and this is a south. They always come in pairs. One of the uh, conundrums of science is um, mathematically and theoretically, there could exist one pole by itself, but nobody's ever observed it or seen it. We call those monopoles. Pol magnetic poles always seem to come in pairs. And my best explanation is because it loops. The magnetic field's loops, because that's what creates it, the little microscopic alignments. Yeah? Lodestone, magnetite. Yeah, it's made up of elements, and those elements, uh, the uh, the spins, the uh, motion of the electrons, just naturally tend to net align in one direction. No, all elements don't have a magnetic force, because if the electrons are always opposite, then they cancel each other out and that thing won't seem magnetic at all. And there's a quantum physics rule that says usually electrons that are in the same electron orbital like to pair up. And one spins up and one spins down, thus the magnetic field is in one direction for each and they cancel each other out. That's kind of the default. So most things aren't magnetic. But that does. Magnet can be made of many different elements, yeah, yeah. Here's a bunch of, treat this as like some uh, individual little atoms inside a bulk magnet. They're all like little, little itty bitty bar magnets. And you can see that they're uh, sort of aligned. Like the ones over here, they tend to be pointing to your right. But the ones right above it tend to point to the left. And these tend to point up, and those tend to point down. There kind of seems to be bunches, sections. We call those magnetic domains. And that's uh, typical in, in, in any substance. If they tend to align themselves in a general direction, the net effect is in one way, then this just became magnetic itself. I'm bringing a, a magnet already near it. So you can expose something to a magnetic field. This guy's magnetic field. And just like charges, uh, like charges repel, opposites attract. Same with poles. North attract south, south attracts north, north repel north, south repel south. And you can see a, a net alignment there because they feel this magnetic field from the bar magnet I brought near it. And so we've temporarily magnetized this guy. If I remove the magnet, whoosh, see how they kind of stay for a while? That can stay magnetized unless it heats up or you bang it. And they tend to, you know, their thermal motion make them go back to normal. Some things will stay aligned longer than others. And so they, be, they make better magnets. If you put it right on top, can you visualize the, the magnetic field lines? See how they, they're north and the south, and they go one direction? So from your perspective, which side's north? The left, 
because the magnetic field lines are coming out the north and around over to the south. Through the magnet and back out. A, a horseshoe magnet, same. It's not as strong as the other one. Let's do it this way. But you get same idea. All magnets have poles and do that. Even, because I don't want to set this up again. This guy. Hello. Got little compass needles around this. Look here, not up there. You see this wire that comes up vertically? Um, moving charges is the source of all magnetism, correct? You know, you know that now. So we can have individual charges moving. What if they're flowing through something? Current. Current is a flow of charge. So if we can uh, make charges move in this conductor, then there should be a magnetic field created around that conductor. And here it is. Let me close the switch. And you see how they make circles around it. This one's going mostly, darn magnets are a little messed up. The, the, don't point at the direction. These got remagnetized. But the, the orientation of them make a circle. And if I switch the direction of the current and move the charges the other way, see how they flip? They're still circles. The magnetic field around a wire is a circle around it. But the field might be pointing up instead of down. If you change direction, they flip. Doink. And doink. So current carrying wires have magnetic fields. And if you'll bear with me, this will take 60 seconds. I'm going to send current through this wire. You see the, the magnetic compass here? It's aligning with what? This is off at the moment. It's a, think of it as a compass needle. And what do compass needles align with? Magnetic fields. And the Earth has a magnetic field, so it's aligned with it right now. It's pointing north. But I'm going to flip the switch and make current go through the wire. Watch the needle. It's now influenced by the magnetic field created around the wire, just like that wire. And so now it's aligning itself with this guy's magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field. And if I switch direction, watch the needle. It goes the other way. If I pause, you can see it deflect. Doink. And it stays going that way. So you change the direction of the current. The magnetic field flips too. Okay, we'll continue magnetism next time.